that reminds me of a story. So story is essential to our humanity and perhaps beyond. I mean, one of the things they think, why we may not really have to worry about the robots is could they actually really think up a new story? You know, that belongs to the human ethos, belongs to the human capacities. Story is the juice that inspires our unfolding. Without story, you would have no civilization, you would have no morality, you would have no inspiration, you wouldn't have much of anything. And you find that when cultures lose their story, their dominant story, they tend to lose themselves. I could give you literally dozens of examples of that. I mean, right now, America is in a state of having lost its original essential story and is thus wandering around and really quite confused, as we see. I mean, we look at the kinds of stories that are on television. They may have a slight beginning, middle, and end, but the hero's journey is not there. The depth of story is rarely there, you see. So the, the point about story is I believe it is one of the organic structures of the human psyche. In the thousands of research subjects that I've had, when I have taken depth soundings of their life and their way of being, I have found that everybody is filled with story. Everybody. And often they're mythic stories, death and resurrection, rites of passage, um, the great journeys of the heroes and heroines of a thousand faces, the adventures of the soul, and I have never tapped into the depth structure of any human being without it being discovering that they were redolent with story. And so when story closes down, either through lack of interest or excess of trauma or whatever, or when it becomes too narrow, then life itself narrows. And that's why I'm saying story is essential to our human becoming and even to our human health. Now, one of the things that's happening in our time is the story is changing very quickly. I'll give you an example. So I'm in India, this is some years ago, and uh, I'm in a, a small town, one of the 600,000 towns, that had, and it had one television set. And the television set belonged to an old Brahmin lady, and it was hung up in the trees because she invited people to come in and, when they were showing the Ramayana. And people came in and they tied up from the fields and they tied up their water buffalo. They came and they sat on the ground and in none goes the Ramayana, great color. I mean, the story of Prince Rama and Princess Sita and how they are betrayed of their kingdom. And they go and live in the forest quite idyllically for 14 years. And then she is abducted by Ravana of the Ten Heads who comes and plucks her off and takes her off to Sri Lanka. Rama, of course, is uh, rather unhappy, and he organizes great armies, including an army of monkeys, led by the saint at Hanuman, and ultimately they rescue her after horrible fighting. So I'm watching this beautiful thing, this beautiful story with all its uh, magnificent costumes and songs and dances and acting, and I mean, it is so phenomenally filled with all manner of splendors. When the old lady, the old Brahmin lady who owns the television, turns to me and she said, oh, I don't like Princess Sita, she is much too passive. What? She is too passive. We women in India were much stronger than that. We have to change the story. It is a terrible example. And I said, madam, the story is at least four or 5,000 years old. That's right, it is out of date. We have to change it. And then she said, my husband's name is Rama. My name is Sita, very common in India. He is a lazy bum. Anything happened, I'd have to go and rescue him. We have to change the story. And then she was uh, interacting with people who were sitting on the ground, and they were all laughing and agreeing. We women in India, we're much stronger than that. We need another story. Because the Ramayana, of course, is the essential story of India. Well, what happens after this beautiful, beautiful, magnificent story ends. What comes on, downloaded from the satellite? 
Dynasty, Dynasty, the American show. And I am so embarrassed. And she says, sister, why are you so embarrassed? Can you not see it is the same story? I said, how can you say that? You got the good lady, you got the bad lady, you got the, you got the good man, the bad man, you got good versus evil, beautiful houses, beautiful clothes. Yes, indeed, it is the same story. Now, what was so fascinating is that I was observing the changing of the story. And that is something that is happening all over the world. The old story, what did it do? It told us who we were, where we came from, it justified our existence, it told us how to train our children, what to do with our criminals, the meaning of life and death. It didn't necessarily make us better. But what it did do is it gave us an organized form within which to understand our lives. You see. And then it died. It began dying in Europe around the 13th and 14th century with the terrible plagues that wiped out 70% of the population of Europe, you see. And suddenly, everything was up for grabs, you see. And everything shifted. The serfdom didn't work. The castles couldn't stand because they had new cannon that would knock them down. People were lost, you know. The, the, but with that lostness came the seeking of a new story. Now, every few hundred years or so, we enter into phenomenal states of lostness, which we are in right now. And we try to fill it up with one thing or another. And now there is, there are such uniquenesses in human history, as for example, in the Ramayana, saying women's role. What is the, what is the big change in our history and our story? It is the rise of women all over the world to full partnership with men in the whole domain of human affairs. Huge, with terrible backlash. But it's huge, and all over the world it is shifting everything, and that's just accelerating. So that's a big one. And as I go around the world, and I've worked in a, what, 108 countries, I find that when you really look at 70 or 80 percent of who's doing the work, it's women. And it tends to be women of a certain age. I mean, it's post-menopausal zest, I think. <laughs> And this is a huge, I mean, they're the ones who are not just out there in the fields doing the work, which always has been so, but they're the ones calling the conferences, rising to meet the Millennium Development Goals, uh, structuring the projects. I mean, you go around to the seminars on development, human development, and social development. Who, who's attending? Huge percentage of women, you see. Because this is the time of the rise of women, which we have to have of a real balance between men and women, or else this world is just not going to survive. Dalai Lama said this you know, not long ago. Only he th said he thought it was going to be Western women who would save the world. I have somewhat more expanded my notion of this, because I find it with women literally all over the world. So you have that. You have you know, the new technologies with the world mind taking a walk with itself. This is, this is a phenomenal insert. People with Kids, especially with transcendental callous thumbs, you know, interconnecting at the speed of light practically. Well, that's a little exaggerated. But the fact is interconnection, the world mind, the rise of women, and of course the biggest issue of all, the climate change. Climate change that in the past would have been over a much longer period of time, even thousands of years, happening in just a few short years. So that we cannot say what the world 20, 30 years from now is going to look like. We know, for example, that the story of cities will change. 40% of the world's great cities and not so great cities are on coastlines. If the, if the waters are rising, as they certainly are, then there's going to be massive migration elsewhere. And water wars to find water to drink. This is huge. Now, what happens in great story, let's say mythic story, story of myth, story of legend, the great stories almost invariably give us solutions. Myth is not a no thing. It is not an airy fairy anything. Myth is great story. Myth is the coded DNA of the human psyche that comes with the, the, the very structure of being human. 
It is coded into our psyche. It flows in our, in our blood. It is there, always murmuring at the back of our minds. And these new mythic structures that are arising out of the old ones, I'm talking about the old ones, look how myth has become so pervasive in the last 30 years, and especially since my old pal, Joe Campbell, did his series, you know, with Bill Moyers, about the power of myth, and people sat up, right, and that's what I need. That's what I need, it's, it's, it is helping me make sense. Why does it help make sense? It helps to make sense because it gives you a plot, it gives you a pattern, you feel called, you know you're living in an outmoded situation, it's time to get on with it, like little Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, I mean, because she's living in outmoded Kansas. She goes to her mother, her, her auntie, 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 you have to listen to me. Oh, go away, Dorothy, can't you see? We're counting our chickens in poor gray, you know, desert spawned, uh, dust ridden Kansas. And clearly, like the hero, she feels a call to a larger existence. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I've heard of once in a lullaby, and she feels that yearning, and it is so intense. And what happens in the yearning of people, of nations, and of course in myths, is that your, learning, your yearning gets to a point that somehow the psyche of the earth responds to you. And here comes the tornado. Da 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 you know. And picks her up, picks the whole house up, and drops her down in another order of reality. So this is part of our story. Many of us believing that we're living in an outmoded situation and it is time to be dropped down, or to seek for, or to explore, or to part the veils between this world and the extended reality, the kingdom, if you will, and enter into the larger reality. And then, in the hero heroine's journey, what happens? Allies show up with Dorothy, Belinda, the great archetype of higher guidance, um, the disempowered parts of herself, mind, heart, courage, showing up to be on this journey of true transformation, which will prove that the one who thinks that he has no brain, the scarecrow, is a tremendous thinker, the one who feels that his heart is rusted away, the Tin Man, becomes the most empathic of beings. And then, of course, the lion, thinking he has no courage, does incredibly courageous things. So the, on the hero-heroine's journey, one is always discovering not just the shadow of oneself, but it's transformation through love, through a great journey, and above all, the opening of a whole new order of meaning and reason to be, you see. So I think we are in a state of exploring the very liniments of new stories. Because we're at the end of one era, and not quite at the beginning of the new one, we are the people of the parenthesis. And the future is seated and coded in a time of parenthesis. So the new story as I've been seeing it are the rise of women. The stories themselves have to have women in it, men and women of different ethnicities, all ages, and access to the deeper realms, to the larger continents of spirit, <clears throat> to subtler or spiritual levels of reality that are also co-partnering you in the great journey, as they do in all the ancient journeys as well. That is certainly happening all over the world. Joe Campbell and I used to have ongoing discussions over years about can any human being singularly create the next myth? And he thought not. He thought it had to arise from the hearts and souls of many people, often with a simultaneity that would allow it to just fire, ignite, evoke the new story at the same time all over the world. And I suspect that's what's happening in our time.
the new story. <laughs>